So first of all, I'm just going to introduce myself. Uh, my name is Salahuddin Patel. Uh, I'm from AIRA, which is the Islamic Education Research Academy, uh, which is a Dawah organization based in London, headed up by uh, Abdul, um, Abdul Rahim Green. <laughs> Forgot his name. Abdul Rahim Green. Have you guys heard of Abdul Rahim Green? Mashallah, he's been like, you know, he's quite well known because he, he's given a lot of talks on Peace TV with Dr. Zakir Naik, uh, Yusuf Esther. So, mashallah, he's well known and he has a passion for the Dawah. Mashallah. So, in 2009, they, they launched AIRA, which is a, a Dawah organization, which was basically to start the sort of mass movement on a grassroots level in the Dawah because he felt like there's a lot of activity that's going on but he wants to basically consolidate it and basically you know at the end of the day just fulfill the hadith of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu where he said that you know Islam will enter every home and how that's going to happen is going to be through people going out there and conveying the message of Islam so you know it's been six years and mashallah you know, Ayra's work has been really beneficial, not just here in the UK, but all around the world. And we've done some recent sort of global campaigns. So, mashallah, you know, the, the, the sort of mass movement globally is really taking off. I want to start by telling you a story. Um, I want to tell you a story about a young boy, a small kid, right? And this kid, his name is Salish. And uh, he grew up in the 80s. Who remembers the 1980s? Remember the 1980s? A-Team. What else was there? Uh, Thundercats? No. Uh, Knight Rider? Dallas? Dynasty? No, no, these are sort of programs uh, that were out there in the 1980s. And in the 1980s, you know, when it came to technology, we didn't have like the internet. We didn't have like smartphones. We had simple things such as, you know, a simple Big TV, VHS, who remembers VHS, the tapes, we had like Spectrum, ZX, we used to play games, you know how they used to play games? You used to get a tape, right, like a cassette tape, and you put it into the player, and you'd have to wait like 5-10 minutes for the game to load. So this, <laughs> this was the 80s, but mashallah, it was the time of the BMX, who remembers BMX? BMX was good man, and like, you know, in that, that day and age, kids used to go out, to the park, you know, the parents wouldn't care, everyone used to just go out together and mashallah, it was, it, was, it was a good time growing up in the 1980s. So there's this young boy called Salesh, he's, he's living in that environment in the 1980s and, and he's born into a, into a Hindu family in London. His parents are from, you know, his father is from India, his mother is from Africa. So as he's growing up, Obviously, you know, he's, he's living in London. Being from a Hindu family, he's following his family's traditions, which is, you know, going to the Hindu temples, doing the sort of celebrations throughout the year, like Holi, maybe Diwali, and all these sorts of Hindu celebrations. So you can imagine this young boy, you know, going to these, these temples and seeing these sort of massive idols right these idols where you'd see human body with maybe some sort of uh some of them like have a human head some of them have like animal sort of heads right so um as this young boy living in the 80s going to the temple following his family tradition and like some of the the idols i don't know if you've heard of any of the hindu idols like shiva krishna ram sita heard of these names yeah so these are sort of the sort of some of the idols that the Hindus sort of sort of follow. So you know, like just like any young kid living in any sort of community in the family, he's following his family's traditions. He's trying to be a good person in terms of you know upholding sort of good family values as well. Um, so yeah, you know, he this this boy he grew up as a Hindu and. Going to the temple, sometimes it would be frightening because imagine like, I don't know if you've ever seen like an idol, yeah, like probably goes up to this ceiling, yeah, massive idol. So a little kid like looking up at this little idol, this massive idol, and you know, this is what 
you know, Hindus sort of project their worship towards. And just to give you a little sort of background into Hinduism, right? If you guys don't know, I mean, Hinduism is really the, the word Hinduism comes from a, a Persian word, which means those beyond the Indus Valley or the river Indus, right? So it's a Persian term. And Hinduism, it doesn't apply to just one type of sort of religion. There's many different branches of Hinduism, right? So there's not just one type. It's like almost saying, you know, I follow monotheism. When you look at monotheism, in terms of the, the theology and the religions around the world, there's many different religions that fall into that. It's kind of like the same in Hinduism, right? So in, in India, this is mainly where the Hindus come from. You have over, like they say, estimate about 1 billion people around the world now that are Hindus. And they make up about 14% of the world's population. So this is a big number, right? That confess to follow this religion. And it's the third largest religion in the world. So after Christianity, after Islam, it's Hinduism. So, you know, there's a lot of people that follow this sort of, uh, this, this religion. And just to give you some sort of history, when it comes to sort of Hinduism, the core belief in Hinduism is pantheism. And pantheism is basically what they believe is that God is within everything or God is everything. So for example, that pillar there, you know, God is within that pillar or this whiteboard here, God is within the whiteboard. So basically they have this belief system that God is within the creation and is part of creation. And this is a core belief within Hinduism. Even though you have many different strains and branches of Hinduism, they all have this as a core belief. And within Hinduism, you have many different gods. And depending on the branch of Hinduism that you follow, they may confess to follow one god, or ten gods, or hundreds of gods, or some people say like three, 30 million gods, according to one of the strains of Hinduism. So it kind of varies, but they have this thing in, um, in common, which is pantheism. And they also believe in something called avatars. Who's seen the film Avatar? Yeah, I thought so. So you know Avatar, it was that James Cameron film, right? And when it came out, it was like the biggest, the most expensive film after the Titanic. So it was a massive film. And I remember when they released it, it was in 3D in the cinemas. And for those guys who have seen it, if you remember, it was like these human beings taking uh, remote control of this vessel. And if you remember, the vessel was this massive like being and it was blue. And that was really striking for me growing up as a Hindu because if you look at the Hindu images, a lot of the idols like uh, Shiva, Krishna, Vishnu, they're all in blue. And this term, they're actually the, the avatar term they took from Hinduism. And it literally means, avatar literally means coming down. So what they believe in Hinduism is that God comes down in human form. A bit like you know, Christianity when they believe in, in Jesus. So this is... Um, this is what they believe in, in terms of their, their core beliefs. And, um, and this term is also known as anthropomorphism, right? Where God morphs into the creation. Also within the Hinduism, you have main texts. Like in you know, Christianity, you have the Bible, the Old Testament, the New Testament. In Islam, you have the Quran. When it comes to Hinduism, you have a, quite a few texts, but the main ones are the Vedas. Right, and these are the oldest scriptures, the Vedic scriptures, and they're written in Sanskrit. Then after that, you have something called the Upanishads. And then after that, you have something known as the Mahabharata, and you have the Bhagavad Gita. Right? So these are like sort of the main core books of Hinduism. And the oldest sort of Veda is, is the Ring Veda. And now there's like different discussions in terms of how old... They believe this text to be, some people say like 10,000 BC, um, some others argue maybe even older. So there's no agreement within the sort of Hindu community how old this sort of text is. Then you have the Upanishad, which literally means sitting down next to. So what the sort of scholars of Hinduism have said that these 
teachings, the Upanishads, are literal teachings where the students would go and sit down next to the Guru. The Gurus are the learned people, right, in India. And they would take teachings from them. And then these teachings were written down, memorized, and then finally written down. These are known as Upanishads. And then you have like uh, the Bhagavad Gita, uh, which is a part of a poem called the Mahabharata. And you have the Ramayana, which is the story of Rama and Sita. Does anyone know the story of Rama and Sita? Yeah. One person, two person, three person. Okay, very quickly, right, to go over it, yeah. Because, uh, you know, the, the, the celebration, Diwali, the festival of light, is based on this sort of tradition, this story. And the story goes something like this, that, you know, God came down as a human form and he got married and he had a wife. Right? And this god, his name was Ram, and he had a wife called Sita. And what they decided to do was, they decided to take like a honeymoon or vacation in the forest, right? With their brother and his wife. So while they were on this vacation, um, the, the, the wife of this god sees this deer, and she wants that deer because it's so beautiful. So the, 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 the god goes out to try and capture this deer. But what he doesn't realize is this is a trick from the devil, right? So when he's going out there, he's distracted. What happens is the devil comes to his wife and then kidnaps his wife. So here you have like a devil kidnapping a god's wife, right? And abducting her and stealing her and taking her to a different island. So then this god Ram, he comes back. And sees that his wife is missing. Right? So what's happened? Then he realizes what's happened. That this devil has taken his wife. So he enlists the help of this other god. Which is a, a monkey god called Hanuman. You may have seen this, right? It's like a, it's a, it's a monkey sort of man. Like, you know when you hear about Darwinism and evolution. The in-between... Uh, <laughs> yeah, the, 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 the in-between uh, uh, mammal Between humans and apes and their ancestors This is it, yeah, Hanuman yeah? So he, this god enlists the help of this other god And what happens is um, They basically build a bridge of rocks To the island where the devil is And they defeat the devil And then they he, he, he's back with his wife, right? And then this tradition of festival of light is where they light the lights, meaning that, you know, God has come back with his wife. So this is basically, you know, just trying to give you an image of you guys that don't know about Hinduism. Imagine this young guy living in the 80s. Remember Knight Rider? Yeah, growing up to this, right? So basically, that's the core sort of concepts of Hinduism. The only other main concept of Hinduism is they believe in something known as reincarnation. Does anyone know what reincarnation is? Yeah, reincarnation basically means that, you know, when you die, you come back as another creation. So there's this life cycle of death and birth, death and birth, death and birth. So what they believe is in this concept of karma. And the karma, what, what it states is, you know, the, 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 the law of cause and effect, that if you're good in this life, then in the next life, when the next cycle happens, you will get something good. But if you're evil, then you may get downgraded. So, for example, if you're human now, and you're a bad human being, when you get reborn, as a form of punishment from karma, you will maybe become a, a beetle or a cockroach, Right? But if you're, good, if you're a good cockroach, then you may get upgraded, right? So this is what they believe, right? This, this, this cycle of, of, of cause and effect. It's called um, samsara, yeah, in, in, in Hinduism. So imagine, you know, some of the things that they believe, like say, for example, you have a healthy child, and then you've got a child that has defects. You know, what they believe is that a healthy child was a righteous person in their last life. And obviously the child with the defects, they believe that this was a, as an evil person from before. And what, they, what, you, what the aim 
is basically as a Hindu is like to fulfill your religious duties, be a righteous person, but also then to achieve this state known as moksha. And moksha means where you break out of this cycle of life and death, where you become one with the creator. Right? It's very similar to Buddhism. When you reach that state of enlightenment, right? You know, they, they do all these spiritual practice, Buddhists, and, and one of the reasons they do it, they believe that, you know, the Buddha, he did so much of this, this spirituality that he, be, he reached something called Nirvana, right? Moksha, where he became one with the Creator. So this is what the sort of Hindus believe, right? In terms of a basic belief. So imagine this kid growing up in the 80s, you know, trying to rationalize these ideas. These ideas that God comes down as a man. There's many gods out there, you know, and not just there are many gods, but there are gods for each different specific purpose. For example, you would have a god of money, you'd have a god of war, you'd have a god of rain. So whenever you wanted something specifically, you'd go and pray to that specific idol, right? So living in the UK, you know, where, you, where you're taught, you know, religious education studies, you, you're, you have a bit of exposure to sort of other religions, you tend to realize as you get older, this doesn't kind of make sense. Yeah, so this guy, Salish, he's getting older and he's thinking, you know what, this don't make no sense. You know, it doesn't make any sense. There's all these gods and then God's a human being and then you've got an idol in front of you. And you know, a man's made this idol if he throws it onto the ground, right? The idol can't help itself. You know, like the prophets used to say so but the thing is like as human beings like most human beings what happens is that we continue to follow the traditions of our family even though it doesn't make any sense you know just to uphold our tradition our identity to be known within the community you know to be accepted you just continue the traditions so this boy even though he rejected these sort of ideology, these concepts, he continued being identified as a Hindu. And then what happened is he grew up with a lot of Muslims around him. A lot of Muslims like from secondary school, primary school, even at college. Yet he still continued to um, sort of identify himself as a Hindu. He would you know, go to the odd sort of celebration like Diwali, massive temple, and, and celebrate with his family. And, you know, for him, you know, he was doing something good. Because when you f obey your parents, when you follow your traditions of your community and your family, then you're doing something good, right? So, this is how he, he sort of grew up. And then he went to college. And then he went to university. And this is when, you know, when you go to these places, you know, this is when he started thinking a lot more and he came into sort of contact or let's say information about other religions and the interesting story about Salish is that when he went to university he had a close friend who was a Muslim that he went to school with now this close friend very good family right in terms of very uh, kind and, and like you know was very sort of righteous in that terms they wanted to uh, they wanted to sort of convert this Christian boy that they knew. So he had a best friend who was a Christian, right? His name was Jason. And basically he was trying so many times and he gave him many times dawah material. The, the, the concept of Islam spoke to him, said like, you know, this is, this is wrong, this is correct. So at that same time, Salish just happened to be there, right? He had, happened to be party to these sort of conversations. And then, you know, he, he, he asked for some Dawah material and Dawah material was given to him. And when the Dawah material was given to him, when this young boy or young man, he read Surah Al-Fatiha, where it talks about, you know, who our Lord is and supplicating to him and who we ask help for and to remain on the straight path and reading about Surah Ikhlas, the concept of God, that there's only one God who is eternal. He doesn't have any parents. He doesn't have any children. And there's nothing unlike to God. 
There's nothing that you can imagine of God. This started to make sense. It started to make sense to this young man. Like, wow, all these years, you know, I've been living in London. He's thinking to himself, I've been around Muslims, but this is the first time that I've heard the message of Islam and it makes so much sense. And when he compared it to Hinduism, the, the, the concept of, you know, the concept of God, God coming down as a man, God, um, there being many gods, this never made any sense because what he understood, what he had, what he had within himself, what was driving him is what we know as Muslims is programmed into every human being. It is that fitrah, that natural innate disposition to believe in your creator. And like, inshallah, I'll be talking about this a lot more in the training session tomorrow. But he had that within him. So even though growing up, he rejected the concept of idol worship and Hinduism, he never rejected the concept of a creator because that was within him. And he would often talk to God, you know, ask God for things. And this is the first time when he read about this in the Quran, it all made sense. Also, when he learned about the Quran, the, 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 the Quran, the final revelation of God, and compared it with the Vedas, the Bhagavad Gita, the Upanishads, that these texts, they hadn't been preserved. But whereas we know the Quran has been preserved, not only in the oral tradition, but from the text itself, right? Also, there's proofs external to within the contents of the Quran that shows that this can only lead to one conclusion, that this is the divine speech of the Creator. And the message of the Quran is very simple. There is one God, worship Him alone. Don't associate partners with Him. Live a good, righteous life. And then if you do, and through the mercy of your Lord, then maybe you will be granted paradise. What an amazing message. So then that started to fall in place. Then he also looked at the Prophet Muhammad, وسلم, the final messenger of God. And he looked at, you know, the, the concept of messengers. Now this made sense. Not that God comes down as a man, but God chooses men to deliver the message. Starting from Adam all the way to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So this finally made sense, right? And when you compared it with Hinduism, there was no contest. He knew, like I said, within himself, that this was the truth. And also when he looked, you know, later on, when he was studying like Hinduism and um, Islam, and especially about the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, what was interesting is, we know like from the Christian sort of scriptures and the narrations and the Jewish narrations that these people were waiting for a prophet, right? We know the Christians were waiting, it's in their text, we know that the Jews were waiting. But what was interesting is when you study the Vedic texts and the Upanishads, it talks about the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Imagine that. It talks about this man coming from Arabia, being a meat eater, having companions, and conveying the message of Islam to the rest of the world. His people being circumcised. His people calling the Adhan. This is all mentioned in their scriptures. So that's it. That's like this, you know, that's just the cherry on the cake, right? So, alhamdulillah, this young man, he decided enough is enough. This is the truth. So Alhamdulillah, by the permission of Allah, he went to Regent's Park Mosque and he took his shahada. Allahu Akbar. And that person, Salesh Patel, he changed his name to Salahuddin Patel. And this is me conveying my message and my story to Islam. But it doesn't end there. It doesn't end there. Right, this is where Allah, alhamdulillah, by the permission of Allah, you know, I was, I was guided to Islam. 
And what an amazing blessing. What an amazing blessing. So, what happened to Salahuddin at that point? So Salahuddin, he was working in the city. You know, I used to work for IT companies as a contractor. I was working for some of these sort of investment banks. And I was just like everyone else. You know, I wanted to be successful in the dunya. So Alhamdulillah, I'm thinking, you know, yes, I'm a Muslim. You know, Alhamdulillah, I'm a Muslim. But also, you know, I want to be successful in this life. So, you know, having some really sort of successful, well-paid contracts, he was working. So this, he went on for this like for six, five, six years until about 2008 and 2009, thinking he's being successful, moving up the ladder, gaining more knowledge, trying to gain material things. But then when 2008, 2009 happened, I don't know if you guys remember, that was when we had the economic crash, you know, the recession, when the housing market crashed around the world. So him being a contractor, like me being a contractor, um, the first people they lay off are contractors. So it was the first time in my life, like, you know, it was hard for me to get a position because I would constantly every week get calls from agencies saying, like, we've got this job, we've got this job, we've got this job. So it's the first time in my life I had time where I was trying to find a job. And it went on like this for, for, for months. And during that time, not being working and not being busy, not being distracted by the distractions of life, real, I realized something was missing in my life. Yes, I'm a Muslim. Yes, I'm uh, making money. I've got a career. I'm working in the city. I'm saving some money. But something's still missing. And what I realized was, and it's my fault, no one else's fault, is when I became Muslim and I took my shahada, I took my Islam from brothers that were not practicing. And Masha, they were good people. I mean, they had good moral values. They stayed within the boundaries of Islam, right? But they weren't practicing. And I realized this is what was missing in my heart, this void. You know, this trying to chase for the dunya, going out there, chasing money, cars, all these material things. I thought, yes, if I go out there, gain these things, I will fill this void. But in fact, the void was getting bigger and bigger. Why? Because I wasn't practicing. So I started to look into, you know, more into the religion of Islam back again and realizing, you know, there are certain duties as a Muslim that we must do. Obviously, the Salah after taking the Shahada being the first of them. So Alhamdulillah, you know, that was, I was going through that transformation where I think a lot of sort of Muslims go through, you know, you go through an age where you're not really practicing, but then Alhamdulillah, you know, people then after some time come back to the masajid, they start practicing. And it was about this time in 2009 that my sister, she was a, a practicing Hindu and she was in Leicester, she was at university. She was studying uh, microbiology, something like this. Um, and she wanted to be a teacher. And she had finished her masters, so she, had, she was moving back home. And I remember like when she moved back home, I was happy because you know it's been like, good number of years that she wasn't, she was away from home. But I distinctively remember like, SubhanAllah, you know, I'm finding more and more about Islam. I'm starting to practice. And obviously the first people you're concerned about is your family, your immediate family, right? So I remember having a conversation with her and saying like, you know, you know, why, why are you following Hinduism? You know, is it because, you know, your parents follow Hinduism? What about, you know, everyone else around the world? Like, what are they supposed to like? Because we're all human beings. Isn't there something that applies to all of us? And like, I remember she, she didn't say anything. And alhamdulillah, you know, what happened was she was, she had a good Muslim friend, mashallah. Unlike me, she had a good practicing sister. And one of the sisters she had was a, was a sort of volunteer for uh, Al Maghrib. And she was invited one day to one of these weekend seminars. Um, I remember her going there and she was worried. And she said, look, can you come with me on the Friday? Because the Friday evening, they have a free course, like a free taster. So if you like it, then you can sign up for the course. So I remember going and I was listening to the sheikh. He was from Egypt. 
uh, mashallah. And um, yeah, I said, look, I told her, look, if you have any questions, don't be scared. Just ask him me straight up. And that was it. That was on a Friday. So she went back on the Saturday and Sunday. I didn't go. I hadn't signed up. And I remember like receiving a text message. And what I found out afterwards was, you know, the sheikh, yeah? The sheikh, I remember he telling me this story like a couple of years afterwards. He was saying, I remember going to that course. I, th I think it was called the Eternal Journey. Um, he's talking about the Sirat, you know, in the, in the hereafter before you get to paradise and uh, the gates of paradise. And he's saying, I remember looking at the sisters and all the sisters, they were all wearing hijab except for one sister. And, he, and you know, he was saying to himself, SubhanAllah, Look at this one sister, she's not wearing hijab. What can I say? What can I do? And then, you know, in these courses, they have a Q&A session with, with, with just the sisters. So my sister started asking questions. And he quickly realized that she's not a Muslim. So then he turned the, the table on her, reversed the question and just asked the Lord, why don't you not believe? Something along those lines. And then he invited her to take the shahada. Allah Akbar, she took the shahada. Imagine in front of all these like, I don't know how many, a hundred sisters or something. Allah Akbar, yeah. And then I get the text message that she's taking shahada. And the sheikh was telling me, Subhanallah, look at me. I was judging that sister for not having hijab. But she wasn't even Muslim. Allah put her in front of me so I could accept the shahada. Allah Akbar. So like, you know, that was like 2009... 2010 time so alhamdulillah you know it, having two people in the family that are practicing makes so much difference it's such a big help you know and i remember that's when like she's been a rock mashallah and i remember in 2010 aira launched their first new muslim retreats and she was uh, invited by her friends so obviously she told me, look, let's go together, let's check it out. And these new Muslim retreats are four-day retreats where you go out, you go away from the dunya, they're Milton Keynes. And mashallah, you know, it's an amazing sort of experience where you just focus on the ibadah of Allah, focus on the basics, you have this amazing brotherhood. And for me, it was a life changer, and for my sister. And that's how I learned, started learning about Ayera and the work that they do. I started getting involved. Um, sort of in, in the sort of work that they do And this is where we are today So You know, alhamdulillah I'm instructor for IERA I go out there, train people I've been around the world You know, training people How to convey the message of Islam Because for me, it's so important Right? Me coming from that background And realising Like, you know, the importance Of, of dawah And you know if we, a lot of like, uh, communities that I speak to, especially in the UK, they're like from an Asian, Indian, Pakistani background, Bangladeshi background. And I tell them, listen, and they do a lot of work where they call you know, the Muslims back to the community, look, come back and worship you know, in the masajid. And they do a lot of darasan. It's amazing work here, mashallah. A lot of people of the brothers have come back and started practicing. But I also remind them, subhanAllah, you know, the story of Taif and the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam. It really applies to them, right? Specifically to the, to the, to the, to the Muslims of the sub-Asian continent. Why? Because when the Prophet Wasallam went to Taif, what happened? They stoned him, right? They stoned him to the extent that he was bleeding and his, his sandals were stuck to his feet, yeah? And the angels came and what they... What did they say to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? What did, what did the angels... Yes, he said, give us the command. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, no. No, maybe from their future generations, they may be righteous. And this was the wisdom of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Right? And now, look at this, right? In India, where the first sort of Muslims were, was a place called Sin. And there was a person from Taif, his name was Muhammad ibn Qasim. He was one of the first Muslims to go over there to sin, to convey the message of Islam. So there, 
the descendants of a lot of the Asian community is because of what happened here in Taif. Because the Prophet ﷺ said, no, you know, wait, maybe from their people, they will go out and convey the message of Islam, like this brother did. And, and the whole of, you know, uh, if, you, if you added the population of India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, the majority is Muslim, mashallah. So, this is just important, you know, I just wanted to share my story and explain to you, you know, just the sort of basics of Hinduism and, you know, why it's so important to go out there and convey the message of Islam. MashaAllah, you know, coming to Huddersfield, you have a really good uh, community here, MashaAllah, really good Muslims. And the problem is when you look at the Muslim community, there's a lot of non-Muslims out there. And like myself, growing up in the 80s, following, you know, Thundercats and... Uh, was it X-Men and my, the traditions of my family I didn't know much about Islam and I knew many Muslims growing up I knew many Muslims and they were good Muslims but no one conveyed the message of Islam to me it was only until someone gave me the message it's like oh the light bulb clicked and there's millions of people like me out there so this weekend what we've decided to do is to do a program here in Huddersfield because it's about time that you know inshallah I know the brothers are active here, but I thought, you know, maybe we can get more of the community involved because it's our duty, like the brother explained in the khutbah today, mashallah, that, you know, if you're going to be here in a non-Muslim land, you have to go out and convey the message. These, a lot of these people that you call your friends, your, your work colleagues, you go out and socialize with, your kids play with their kids. What kind of friend are you that when it comes to the day of judgment, Allah is going to ask these people, did you worship me? And they'll say, no. Why not? Didn't the message of Islam come to you? No. Why not? Weren't there any Muslims around you? Yeah. I had hundreds of Muslims around me. But not one of them bothered to tell me about this day. SubhanAllah. So what's going to happen? Fingers going to get pointed back to us as a community. Please don't forget to like us and share us on the Digital Member Facebook and Twitter. Please also subscribe to the Digital Member YouTube channel in the links below.